thanks, um, Ed, for the semi-introduction. So I'm a, a microbiologist and virologist here at Auckland Hospital, but have also had the pleasure of working with uh, groups outside and talking today about HIV testing, but not just HIV testing, as we've heard, it's, it's about how we can link in um, testing across the different silos and make sure that we've got an integrated te uh, testing bundle going forward for people. So let me just work out how to change it over. So first of all, we're going to be talking about point of care, and I think point of care has great advantages, but we have to have a note of caution there, which is that um, certainly since COVID, we've had a flooding of the New Zealand market with some um, sub suboptimal uh, products. So for example, in pharmacies or even on the internet, there's a lot of you know, rapid tests which don't, don't meet the criteria that any of us would, would use them for. And in particular, earlier this year, there was a uh, heavily marketed chlamydia, gonorrhea, and herpes rapid test, which were not fit for purpose. And I think my point around these is there should be a good clinical governance structure around the delivery of any point of care test. And you need to be aware within that of the limitations of that test. It doesn't mean you don't use it, but you just need to be integrating that into your policy. So, HIV, and talking about innovation, hmm, I guess you can be ju the judge of that because not s stuff doesn't generally change over time. What we've got, and, and we've had a presentation at the front from AuraQuick, so AuraQuick is a oral fluid based HIV antibody test which provides a result within 20 minutes. Uh, these costs are indicative. The um, AuraQuick, because it's based on saliva the, and antibodies, the antibodies in saliva are slightly less present than they are in blood, so you would expect that the sensitivity would be a bit lower than a capillary blood-based test. But again, it's, it's something that you just need to take into account when, when you're thinking about how these tests are being used. SD Biolign is something which has the added advantage of syphilis testing. So this is just doesn't do the RPR or, or the um, TPPA, but, um, and, and that probably misses about a third of cases. So again, something to take into account. And probably the most technolo technological advancement is the INSTI, and, and I think this is used for hepatitis C and other infections as well. And the advantage of this is the speed, so you can have a result within one to five minutes. If you look in the bottom left, here, this is just a, this is an, a, a comparison of the sensitivity of the AuraQuick and the INSTI for all HIV on, on the left. And you can see that the AuraQuick might miss up to eight cases per 100 of all HIV versus the INSTI of three to four cases per 100. This is compared with a laboratory test, and the difference there is the antigen component. So the fourth or fifth generation tests in the laboratory have HIV antigen and antibody. Um, but if you take, and we know part of this is because of acute or uh, early HIV, so if you take those cases out, you can see the performance increases, but be aware that some cases will be missed, particularly with the oral fluid-based tests. And Ed's already mentioned most of this, but beyond rapid tests, there are other techniques that we can use to look out to people in, um, in the region, in, in the communities, and test them. So dry blood spot testing for serology or for RNA for hepatitis C. Another option is mini-collect. So this is capillary blood into a small blood bottle, which can then go back into the laboratory. The main um, drawback of this, which again is relative, is that there's a higher failure rate compared with dry blood spot. And then this is actually the most exciting thing on the bottom right here, which is a, a disposable at home <coughs> nucleic acid amplification test. It's not for HIV, this is for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas. But this is where I'd love to see developments over time. It's costly at the moment, but again, I, I think as we see product expansion, this cost will come down and we'll start to see things more exciting in the diagnostic space for in other infectious diseases. So that was a test, the tools that we have, but 
aside from that, the most important thing, I think, is how, how we put them together and deliver them so that we can actually access those people. So who is it that we're looking to test, and do they know about the test? So this has been my experience, is we really need to upfront define what the success is. What, is. what does it look like to us? Is it the number of tests we're performing? You know, are we happy with three a day, 300 a day, or is it the infections that we're diagnosing, is it those people that we're linked into care, and as Ed was talking about, is it avoided cancer, for example? And then who are we looking at? Are we looking at a really high risk population, or are we looking at all of population when we start to get down to looking for the, you know, the last 10% of people? And do people know about it? So advertising is, seems really critical to get this into people's faces so that they can see what's available for them. Otherwise, they won't know about this brilliant thing that you've got out there. Um, is it easy to access for them? How much does it cost to the patient? And how much does it cost in terms of resources to the provider? And have you maximized the bundling potential? And that's not siloing your test. So for an example on the right, what we can do nowadays is you can put this on a bus or you can take it out to the most rural community is a really quite a comprehensive sexual health and hepatitis C bundle, and I forgot about the hepatitis B, but um, using, for example, the rapid tests or and a gene expert, which can do your nucleic acid amplification for chlamydia, gonorrhea, HPV as well, and it can do confirmatory testing for hep C and HIV. Really simple things can make a really big difference, and this is things like just changing a paper form or an electronic form. And I'll show you how. And this can go across uh, primary care, antenatal care, corrections, to hospitals. And here's a couple of examples. So as you know, we recently moved from opt-in to opt-out HIV antenatal screening in the northern region. And that was a matter of changing electronic form changing a paper form in a hospital and changing the way that the laboratory um, looks at a bundle as it comes through, um, you know, through into the laboratory. Obviously, doing these things with appropriate consultation, we increased antenatal coverage from 87% of um, people who were attending for their first antenatal bladders to 98%. And similarly, on the right, with the introduction of third trimester syphilis rescreening, I can't tell you the coverage, but I can tell you the volumes have substantially increased, particularly in Northland, where there was no um, program of third trimester delivery before this started. So to summarise, point of care has great advantages, but also has risks and needs good governance around it. There has been a few interesting technology developments, but essentially they are unchanged. You can maximise your yield by bundling and by programmatic delivery, and great successes can be achieved with minimal effort. And that's the end of me.